that spot as it were. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome along to the next instalment in our um, Cornwall Wildlife Trust Marine Team Talks. And joining us today, we're very lucky to have Mick Boss from the University of Exeter. So uh, yeah, take it away, Mick. All right, thanks for inviting me, Matt. Yeah, my name is Michiel Voss, but Mick is easier to pronounce. Um, I'm going to give a talk on, uh, on seaweed photography, which, like I said, is a little bit niche. Um, there's lots of people taking photos underwater, uh, divers and snorkelers. Uh, there's some people who like seaweeds, but not a lot of people that take photos of seaweeds. Uh, but that's what I will be talking about. Um, and hopefully you'll like it and want to take seaweed photos yourself. Um, and as Matt said, I, live, uh, I, I work at the University of Exeter in Cornwall. I'm originally from Holland. I moved here in 2012 after living in Holland and Germany, England, then Holland, and, and now in England again. Um, I'm a microbiologist um, in, in Penryn, in the um, Environment and Sustainability Institute. Um, and um, I am still kind of doing marine biology, but more as a hobby. So yeah, when I moved to Cornwall, I was more like a kid in a, in a sweet shop um, because uh, at low tide, every low tide, it would go out and every time you would find something new, fantastic uh, fish and crustaceans and, and uh, all kinds of tunicates and sponges and mollusks. Um, uh, fantastic. And I originally only took photos with my iPhone. So these are all just iPhone photos. Um, I never dropped it in the water, luckily. Uh, so that went well for a couple of years. Uh, so I really enjoyed that and I learned a lot. Um, I got a bit carried away. I also had a, a big net, like an eight foot uh, net that I moved from Holland. That was not very convenient, but I was glad I did. Um, so from the key here in Flushing, uh, this is with a friend. Um, I was always catching fish, so I think I had like 12 different species of fish that we could just catch from the from the key and flushing. That was nice. Um, a lot of beach combing as well, from from little things to bigger things. There's a dolphin uh, in Falmouth, and maybe some of you remember the sperm whale in, in Perranporth. I think it was two years back, or three years maybe. I also started an aquarium. Um, and yesterday, Matt had this brilliant talk about anemones. Um, I tried to grow seaweeds uh, first in my aquarium, but uh, not with a lot of success. It's very difficult. And I think later in the talk, you'll probably um, see why it wasn't such a success. So now I have all these different uh, anemones here, like the, the dahlias that uh, Matt uh, talked about, and beetlets and snake locks and red speckled. Um, so that's great. That's a, a nice hobby, actually. I don't know if you can see it. It's right over there. Um, I also I also did some diving. This is with a friend, uh, the Merle bats in um, in in the fall estuary. Uh, I don't do a lot of diving because it's it's quite a. I don't have my own kit. I don't really have the space for it. Uh, so sometimes I I dive with uh, Mark Milburn uh, from Myler, uh, or do some shore dives. Uh, and it's great. Uh, and because I was doing all those things, I thought, well, I'll, I'll start a, a blog about it because I was always taking photos and it was also a nice way for myself to keep track of what I was seeing over the years. Um, and I asked a colleague who um, spoke a bit of Cornish. Um, I asked him about a potential good Cornish name for a rock pooling blog. And um, he suggested Unbolinessor which means the rock pool hunter, which I thought was a great uh, name. The only downside I think is that if someone asks me about the blog and I say it's Ambolinessor, then like four seconds later, they forgot the name of the blog. Um, so it's not, uh, the traffic is relatively light, so to say, but it's more for myself than uh, anywhere else. But you know, if you're interested in these photos, you can have a look there. And also I started, um, uh, on Instagram, which is on, on one hand, it's, it's highly addictive and a, and a waste of time. But on, on the other hand, it's quite nice because with social media, the same with Facebook, there's lots of like-minded people and you can ask for advice, for instance, on, on photography. So that was, that was quite nice. So that's the Unbolinessor uh, blog. Okay. 
so yeah, seaweeds. I saw seaweeds when I was rock pooling, um, and I knew there were green seaweeds and red seaweeds and brown seaweeds, but often you see them on the rocks or on the beach and they get a bit smelly. Um, and I wasn't particularly interested in the seaweeds. Um, until one time I was rock pooling. Um, you see in the bottom, you see the spatula that we use in our household for making pancakes. Uh, and I remove anemones from the rocks for my aquarium with it as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a very useful tool, multifunctional. Um, and I was rock pulling, it was not very nice the weather, and I saw this tiny little pool and I just dipped my camera in. And this is a, a cheap kind of um, camera that can go whatever, three meters deep and it's kind of shock proof and dust proof. Um, and I thought, actually, this is really beautiful. It's like a little miniature landscape with lots of shapes and, and colors. So actually I thought maybe these seaweeds are quite interesting to take photos of. So I, I had my iPhone, I had this little, Canon um, camera and then later I upgraded to a better a Canon uh, G16 power shot and uh, then last year I bought a more fancy Olympus mirrorless camera um, and from those latter, latter two um, cameras I will show you photos in this talk and so with lots of practice and a better camera I went from this to this so I think there's there was progress was made. Um, and if I go to the beach, I, I try to go to different places in Cornwall, but 90% of the time I go to the same spot in Falmouth. Um, so this is Tunnel Beach. Um, it's in between Castle Beach and Gilly Beach. Uh, you see the entrance is, is a tunnel, which is closed at the moment because people are vandalizing it regularly, unfortunately. But uh, that's kind of my regular spot where I always go. And I think it's probably, it's probably one of the best places in Europe to go rock pooling. Um, I haven't been everywhere, but this is as good as it gets, uh, I think. So I had this, this power shot that I bought in 2016, and I noticed that even in winter, the seaweeds looked quite nice. So it was my plan for 2017 to take seaweed photographs um, every month of the year. So I dipped in in January, uh, and you can already see that there's lots, lots of different species, and they're all growing, even even in the middle of winter. So this was this is pretty chilly. So it's about nine degrees. Um, so I had I had some friends joining me, um, but usually they joined for one time, and then they were not that enthusiastic the next time I asked them. Um, so yeah, you see in January, you see. Um, Lots of these seaweeds are, are epiphytes, so you see here a little kind of probably um, sargassum wire weed, but with at least like four or five other seaweed species growing on top of it. Um, and this is February, you still you see you see that this, this big seaweed is still quite bare, but there's there's all kinds of things that start to grow. I lost a photo here, but on the on the left you see a wetland. So <clears throat> with this camera, you put it in a housing. And then you don't put it in a housing with a special lens on because you can't fix a lens to these types of compact cameras. Um, but you can attach a lens to the outside of the housing. Um, and the good thing is that you can change the lens underwater. So you can change from a wide angle lens, like you see here, also to a macro lens. So when you see a nudibranch, like on this picture on the right, uh, you can change the lens and then you can snap a, a picture of the tiny nudibranch as well recognize that needy brand from yeah. the talk last week yeah yeah excellent talk yeah we'll have to check out yeah yeah so we carry on yeah yeah um so this is early march so you see it, it still looks kind of the same these um these are mermaid's purses of the bull hus or the nurse hound uh, shark which are actually relatively common um uh, it looks very kind of reddish pinkish purplish um and this is, so when I talk about snorkeling, it's not really snorkeling, snorkeling. So no fins or anything. So this is, uh, this is how we do it. This is actually Tom Daguerre, who some of you might know. Uh, he's, uh, he's produced uh, uh, movies for the Wildlife Trust. Um, and so he's filming here. So it's, uh, it's often just kind of lying on your belly on the, on the sand or on the rocks. So it's very shallow. Um, 
And this is actually, uh, check out uh, Tom's website, Hydro Motion Media. So I also booked in a day with him um, uh, for him to teach uh, me more about photography because I didn't really know anything about photography. So if you're interested in developing your photography skills, you can give him a ring and he can, he can uh, give you kind of a bespoke kind of a course. So then things really changed only like two weeks later. So this is mid-March. Um, and you see this explosion of, of color and, and form. So I think in this photo, again, it's like 10 different seaweed species, uh, red ones and brown ones and green ones, all kinds of different species. Um, so that's when the seaweeds really started to come out. And that continued into April. So here you see uh, Irish moss, um, which is beautifully iridescent. Uh, on the foreground, in the background, you see this uh, wire weed, which is invasive. And uh, you see the most fantastic colors. So you see this bushy rainbow rack. I have a bunch of more, more photos of this uh, seaweed because it's my favorite seaweed. Um, and yeah, all these different types of textures and, and colors. So this is part of this, uh, this shot here. Um, and I like this so much. I posted it on, on Facebook. Um, and Francis Bunker, who wrote um, um, a guide on, the, on a sea search guide uh, on seaweeds, actually, um, put the names of all the species on, on my photo, which, uh, which is a very nice idea to do. So again, it's like 10 different species just in, in one shot. And this is the guide I was talking about. So if you're interested in seaweeds, this is kind of a must have guide. It's, uh, it's not that expensive actually, especially not for what it is. It's very high quality, lots of species, lots of uh, photos, lots of information. So that's kind of the, the Bible. Um, and the seaweeds of the North, Northeast Atlantic Facebook group is also uh, very helpful. So if you have a seaweed that you can't identify, just post it there and, and people will, will help you out. Um, and another uh, very useful site is A Photo Marine. Matt mentioned that uh, site yesterday from uh, David Fenwick, which has lots of seaweeds and lots of other um, organisms um, as well. Every organism you can think of from whale strandings to, uh, to forearms and, and algae. And if you look on my blog, there's a link page and I've tried to get lots of useful links on uh, rock pooling <clears throat> and aquariums and photography um, all together. Okay, so this is a photo of mid-April. Again, um, lots of different species, but there's, it starts to kind of, it's a little bit over the hill. So some of these seaweeds start to get a little bit fuzzy or a, a little bit yellow. So it's still quite nice, but the peak of the seaweeds is incredibly short. It's only a couple of weeks. Again, another photo of mid-April. And here you see the, the, the thong weed in the background, a very long uh, seaweed, brown seaweed. And you see the harpoon weed on the foreground, the, the pink, um, that's an invasive species. Um, and you see the start of uh, lots of uh, sea lettuce, that's the green stuff. So end of April, um, it is, Change. So there's a lot more of this kind of sea lettuce. Um, this uh, thong weed and the wire weed um, grows and grows as so it's quite big plants. Um, and also you see all the fish appear. So two spot gobies and uh, a juvenile pollock um, start to appear in the rock pools. Uh, here's another example of little fish and you see it gets a little bit browner. Then in June, that was kind of, I still remember that day, I'd never that's always the problem in, in Cornwall is that the visibility, of course, always is, is, is not great. Um, and there was this uh, period in June, two years ago, uh, when there was not a lot of wind and uh, visibility was just amazing. Um, so this, this was really, really nice to snorkel into. And you see all these nice reflections of seaweed. I don't know what spe species this is actually, but it grows on the thornweed. Um, and here you see the wire we growing and it forms like tunnels that you can swim um, under and through. But then July, uh, it gets warmer and you see that all this pink harpoon weed kind of turns yellow and, and white. And, and it looks very different. So most species just disappear and they just melt away. And in August it's even worse. So it's, not a very pretty picture, but you get the idea of that all this kind of fresh spring diversity is just, just gone. 
So I don't have photos of September, but this is October. And you see that the harpoon weed suddenly is um, a nice pink again um, and, and things start growing. So there's actually a, a second kind of autumn peak um, of seaweed growth. So you see this nice, this is actually a, a species that has been kind of moving up from, from the south. Um, and I think it's only recorded from Flushing and Falmouth in the, in the UK, although it's probably spreading, it's probably in other places now. And this is November, um, and it all looks kind of nice and growing again. Um, I, don't, I don't have a photo of December. Um, probably the weather was just uh, too bad. So kind of this is, this is the point I want to make. Timing is everything. So I think that was horrendous this year. I think from September to February, it was just so foul and, and miserable. Uh, so really, you, you can't see much because it's just kind of the water is milky and it's just so cold and horrible. Um, and then in spring, there's two months where it looks great. Uh, and in summer, it's not great, although the visibility sometimes is good. The seaweeds don't look great. And there's a little little spot at the end of the year where, where it looks good. Uh, so it really is about the right season, but also the right tide, because if it's low, low tide, that's, where, that's when I go um, in these very shallow pools, high tides, uh, you can't really see the seaweeds if you're snorkeling. At least I can't, maybe if you... Uh, if you're a bit fitter than I am, you can dive deeper. But then it's also it's also about the light. So if you if there's a lot of water above you, then things of course turn a little bit more bluish and uh, less vibrant. Um, and so the visibility is is kind of key. So you you need um, the wind to die down and a little bit of sun. So if you have all these kind of right combination, I think maybe maybe there's just you know ten or twenty days a year when the conditions are perfect at least in this particular site okay so that was kind of the my experiment in 2017 and then last year i bought a new camera so this is a mirrorless camera um, and this is one of those so it's not uh, an slr um, it's smaller but you can change lenses uh, on this so i have a fish eye lens um, and i have a uh, underwater housing that has this kind of dome-like port uh, to accommodate this uh, fish lens. Um, and this is um, a photo, again, uh, where you see, this is very shallow. This is probably you know, 20, 25, 35 centimeters deep or something um, with 10 or so species just in one uh, frame, uh, which is uh, it's always nice to see. And I thought I'll just show you a couple of common species, some of my favorite species. I guess there's um, maybe seven or 800 types of, of seaweeds in total in the UK. Um, and, uh, and I think the Southwest is a hotspot for, for seaweed diversity compared to the rest of the country. Um, and I guess you can see several dozen, dozens of species easily if you, if you do your best um, at this site. So this is a berry wart cress, beautiful red species. Another red species, flat, is a red rags. This is Irish moss. I, I showed a picture. This also has these iridescent uh, tips. Um, this is actually used a lot in the food industry. So it's in, in toothpaste um, and uh, in chocolate milk um, and in all kinds of different things that you don't know of. Um, there's a particular E number associated with the carrageenan that they get out of this. Um, so you can actually look up what in your, uh, on your shelf has Irish moss in it. This is Juicy Whirlweed. I think a lot of those names they had to make up for this book because they only have scientific names and they kind of probably had a couple of uh, evenings at a table with a bottle of wine and deciding on some <laughs> common names. <laughs> This is little fat sausage weed. And this is black scour weed. So this you often find on rocks and, and gravel. So it's uh, really resistant to, to scouring. Sea flax weed. Um, so this is a portrait uh, uh, photo of a des desmarest flattened weed that I recently saw. 
and this is this uh, thong weed. So it starts out on the right in these kind of, I don't know what you call them, um, and then they grow up into these buttons that you see on the on the left, and they grow out in like a, a thong shape. So first, first one stem that splits, um, and these are, you know, more than a meter long. So they they probably grow like a centimeter a day or something, really fast. And and this is an edible species, by the way. This is under tongue weed, the one on the front. This is false eyelash weed. This is one of your favorites, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> and it changes a lot through the year, doesn't it? Yeah, so it starts to, you know, it starts to get yellow um, now. So in the beginning, it's really kind of dark purple, and then it starts to go brown, orange, yellow. Yeah. It's quite common. Red grape weed. It's also quite common. And this is a photo with three species, bushy berry, rack. Um, it's, it's very kind of strange for a seaweed. It's almost wooden. It's very, uh, very tough. Um, and because it's a kind of a big and tough species, lots of other seaweeds can settle on it. So you have this harpoon weed, this invasive species um, that's growing on top of it. And uh, this brown fan weed is quite common. Um, it's also growing growing on the same plant. Um, Mickey, just to let you know, we're getting quite a few people posting questions using the chat function. If any anyone doesn't know about that, please use the little uh, speech bubble and type in your questions as at the end of the talk, we're going to get round to all of those. Yeah. Great. Fascinating. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this is my favorite species that I mentioned, the uh, bushy rainbow rack, um, bright blue. And this has another uh, invasive red species attached to it, Bonamason's hookweed, which is very fine. It looks superficially a little bit like this harpoon weed, but it's redder um, and it has little kind of hook structures uh, attached to it. So it probably can attach to other uh, seaweed species. That's one I haven't seen um, before in Falmouth, so not particularly common, is it? I don't think one. Uh, it is it, not as common as harpoon weed, but it's, um, yeah, you, you'll, you'll see it. Yes. Yeah, I think it starts to grow a little bit later. Right. But yeah, yeah. This bushy rainbow rack. I think you know, if you've seen it, then you'll remember it because it's so striking. At first, I thought it was some kind of oil slick or something weird going on because it was like all these different shades of of blue. Um, and then I found out that it's actually iridescent, um, and so it's not blue because of any pigments, uh, but it's it's because of the the surface structure, uh, the microstructure that reflects light. Um, in, in a different way, depending on the angle of light or the, or the angle of view. So it's, it's, it's exactly as if you're holding uh, a CD or looking at oil slick um, or in some shells, you see it. There's also pearlescence, which is a slightly different. So pearls also have a little bit of this effect, but they reflect more white light and iridescent is not so much about the white light. Uh, so you see it in minerals, you see it in birds and, and animals, especially insects and even some uh, plants as well. Uh, but also in seaweeds. And I found this actually, so maybe Matt knows this guy, Philip Henry Goss, a famous um, naturalist from the Victorian era who wrote books uh, about rock pooling and he also popularized the sea aquarium. So there was this uh, Victorian craze about sea aquariums, which I think quickly died out because uh, if, if you're in the late 19th century in the middle of London with a little kind of box of seawater and an enemy, without being able to change the water, then I think it was a success probably after a while. It's a bit uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with this seaweed, it's blue depending on the angle, otherwise it's a bit brown. So if you, if you um, lift it out of the water, it's, it's, it's quite brownish. And when you get, get it back in the water, it's really bluish. So he described it as, thus it may be compared to some Christians who are dull and profitless in prosperity, but whose graces shine out gloriously when they are plunged into the deep floods of affliction, <laughs> which I thought was, was brilliant when I, uh, <laughs> when I read that. That's not how scientists um, write anymore. So how scientists write about this is, uh, is like this, light-induced dynamic structural color by intracellular 3D photonic crystals in brown algae, kind of, that's how we would describe it now. <laughs> and this is, this is a paper in Science Advances, which is a, a very prestigious journal. Um, and the lead author is Heather Whitney. So I knew 
I, I, I saw this, I found out about this iridescence in the seaweeds um, and I wanted to know how it worked or why they were iridescent and I did some Googling and her name came up um, as someone working at Bristol, Bristol University and looking at iridescence in plants. So I decided just to send her an email and say, hey, what's, what's going on with this seaweed? Can you tell me why they do this? Um, and, and she replied and she said, I had no idea seaweeds do this. Can I come over and can you show me um, where they are, what they look like? So I said, sure, come over. So I invited her for a seminar and then we went rock pooling and I showed her the rainbow rack and she was completely blown away by it. And she took away plants back to Bristol and she started this whole research project and she found out exactly how the iridescence in this species works. So I had my question answered very, very well, actually, in the end. That was, that was quite fun. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can read this. This is actually, if you Google this, you can download the paper and, and you can have a look. But yeah, it's, it's quite technical. I haven't really studied it in, in much depth myself, but it, it's great that she did it. Um, and so this species is also quite amazing because there's so many other um, seaweeds um, and also animals attached to it. So you see lots of tunicates and sponges um, that are growing on this, um, on this seaweed, probably because it's perennial. So um, it's not something that dies off after a couple of months. So they can, they, they can kind of grow, grow on there for years. Um, and so these uh, sharks also use pretty much only this seaweed to attach their, um, their mermaid's purses to. So this is a photo of, of a little bit of this uh, seaweed and you see all the different kind of red seaweeds attached to it. So I think it might be uh, fun as a project to try to take a photo of each species, species living on this particular seaweed and probably you could get like at least a hundred species, I'm sure. Okay, so I just want to have a couple of slides left about what I, what I want to do in the future. Um, so I've mainly focused on Falmouth, but I noticed last year I was in July, I was on the North Coast, St. Agnes, um, and the water was so much more clear and warm and blue. I thought I need to go to the North Coast a bit more often. And it's an absolutely brilliant spot. And lots of fish as well, lots of weaver fish actually that, that you could swim. So you have to be careful if you go there. Um, and this is a plant I saw, uh, mermaid stresses. They also grow, I don't know, more than five meters probably tall, uh, which was quite common there. Um, and I showed this harpoon weed. And this is also harpoon weed, but it's a different stage in the life cycle. So this is either the, the gametophyte or the sporophyte. I, I don't know which way around they are. But this was actually described as a falcon birdia as a completely different species until they found out that actually this is the same thing as the harpoon weed. I think it even has a different geographical distribution that doesn't, doesn't um, completely overlap. So it's fascinating uh, life cycles, uh, some of these seaweeds. Uh, and this is discoid forkweed on a patch um, of rock in the sand. Um, yeah, so next March, I guess, when or maybe maybe in September, if we are allowed out, um, I'd like to take more photos of, of beautiful species and find out more about them. For instance, this species, is, this red species, I see often in the pools, but I don't know what it is. So it's unfortunately not easy just to take a photo of the seaweed and identify it from the photo. Um, you have to really kind of take it home and put it under the microscope and sometimes dissect it and put it on the microscope. But I must say, I really like them and I like to take photos of them, but I, I don't really like them enough to also take them home and do all the micros microscopy work because, uh, you know, I do, I do all the science in my day job. So I kind of want to just kind of relax and float in the water and, and look at pretty seaweeds rather than make a scientific study out of them. So I would also like to play around a bit more with these over under shots that you can do which are quite quite tricky to do um, but quite fun and this is a photo with a very shallow depth of, of field so you can kind of play around with um, different techniques to take photos so the background is a lot more blurry which is um, helps if the visibility is not good anyway you can't really see what's going on in the background i've also done some macro uh, photography so this is a tiny uh, chink shell on the bushy rainbow rack. So if, if the 
if the light, so for macro photography, you usually uh, use a, a strobe, like a flash gun. Um, and it really depends on the angle. So if the angle is not right, this whole background is brown. But if it's right, then it's this nice, nice blue color. Uh, and this is actually a more recent photo where I took, um, took one of the strobes and uh, held it in my hand. And uh, after about 100, 100 times trying, this one came out quite nice. Um, so you see the bushy rainbow rack uh, with the thong weed around it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I had. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much, Nick. That was really fascinating and really stunningly beautiful to the photo. But also, it's really it's interesting to sort of get your enthusiasm, and, you know, the interesting facts, and you know, amazing that no one no one had studied the uh, harpoon. Uh, sorry, the um, the rainbow rack. No, that is, that is amazing. So yeah, well done for getting that. I'm, I'd, I'd <laughs> like to try reading that, although I'm pretty uh, pretty confident I, I won't be able to understand it. <laughs> but, no, it's, it's very technical, but yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's great. We, ha we have um, quite a few good questions pop up during the talk, and one of them was was about the lighting. A uh, lady asked whether, um, just open up, whether you're using lighting, and I, I guess you're mainly using natural light in those very Yeah, shows. except for these couple last photos, it's just natural light. So that is, that is always with photography, uh, the tricky thing, you want to kind of maximize the light, um, but you also want to maximize kind of the depth of field and the greater the depth of field, the smaller the aperture is and, and there's less light. So either you have to use a higher ISO, which makes it more grainy, uh, or a longer shutter time, which is a problem if the seaweeds wave about because then you, you need a short shutter time for things that move. So it's really kind of using manual settings and finding the optimal compromise between the ISO and the, and the shutter time and the, and the f-stop or the, the aperture. Um, so I, I have tried now uh, once or twice um, with a flash gun and that helps um, because you get all the light on the foreground so, so, so you solve that problem. I guess with a flash gun it's um, often that you get the backscatter so you light up any particles that are in the water and you get all these white specks in your, in your photo um, so that's the other kind of very tricky thing to do. So that's uh, something I need to need to practice. If, if it's on an arm and the angle it's coming from the side, you get less, don't you? Less backscatter. Yeah, yeah. Usually you uh, point it away, even the light. So mm -hmm. basically, the the light shines out as a cone, and you want the edges of the cone to hit kind of the foreground, the object that you're trying to photograph, um, and minimize the light that falls in front of your of the object right. that you want to photograph um, but i had one stroke malfunctioning so i just brought one um but yeah it's 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 very tricky with the with the strobe you have to kind of get the settings exactly right the position exactly right yeah and looking for clear water helps so i think yeah the, the shots you got on the north coast that day were amazing it's, it's not yeah, was, I mean, on the north coast though is it because the surf yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is. If if the visibility is bad, then it's just almost impossible to take a decent photo. That's just uh, yeah. <laughs> that's just it. So I'm gonna uh, just have a quick look through the the, uh, the questions, and if anyone has a question as well, um, please do type it into your chat section. And um, someone asked which university you live. I think you already explained uh, University of Exeter in Falmouth. Um, yeah, so it's not Falmouth University, but it's the University of Exeter, yeah, in Pembrine. Where do they grow and harvest seaweeds that are used commercially? So this is from Tim, uh, and is seaweed farmed? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Uh, where do they grow and harvest seaweed that's used commercially? I think this question came in after you're talking about the Irish moss, which turns up in lots of yeah. uh, lots of different products. So Irish moss, I think, for all the carrageenan that's used now, uh, comes from species that are farmed in the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, I think Irish moss is not commercially used much in compared to those kind of uh, tropical species. I think it's still yeah. used. I mean. 
in Ireland, people, you know, still use it to make uh, concoctions when you have a sore throat and everything, but not on a commercial basis. There's the Cornish uh, Seaweed Company, uh, run also by a Dutch guy with a red beard, uh, Tim yeah. van Berkel. Um, and they have been harvesting uh, seaweeds uh, for years and selling them fresh, but also dried. Uh, I think they're, they're in several supermarkets as well. Uh, and they have now started uh, to farm seaweeds, which is really the way forward. And that's done by, um, from companies, you can actually buy rope that is seeded with, uh, with the seaweed of interest. Um, and you hang that rope in the water and it grows off the rope and then you can get the rope out in a boat and kind of cut it off um, and, then, and then put it back and it grows again. Um, so that's done uh, near Porth Keris, Porth Hallow. That's right. Uh, I think they're they're trialing well. it now with a, with a oyster farm or mussel farm. Yeah, they're also, they're doing it in St. Oscar Bay as well. And the mussel farms make great structures, don't they, for hanging yeah the ropes yeah and it's also kind of the um the plants can kind of use the waste of the animals and kind of reduce the nutrient level um it can also protect the coast from surges because if you have all these kind of ropes with seaweeds extending kind of they they act as a buffer um but yeah i think it's it's great um actually i i i lead a module at the university oceans and human health and we had a uh we had a field trip to my favorite place, um, looking for edible seaweeds and cooking them up as well, actually. And he was, um, Tim came by and, and talked about his company and all the health benefits of seaweeds. They're super healthy. They have lots of minerals and proteins and fibers and vitamins. Um, mm. But I think, so it's good for a human health uh, perspective, but also environmental health, because uh, it's actually food that you don't need any fresh water for you don't need any land, you don't need any pesticide. Um, so it's, it's really a superfood. Yeah. The, the next question was, are there any types of seaweed at risk from environmental issues? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So there's a, a, a bunch of invasive species. Um, yeah. And this harpoon weed is one and the wire weed you saw, but there's a couple of others. Uh, I think potentially they could displace native seaweeds yeah um but uh of seaweeds under under threat i don't know so there's there's kind of uh calcareous um seaweeds like this this coral weed um and i guess if you have things like ocean acidification those types of seaweeds will will be affected by that yeah. um i think also you see that since they're so seasonal um I think um, warming seas will also affect them, definitely. I think uh, sea level rise will also affect them because um, of something uh, known as coastal squeeze. So normally sea level rise, if there's no humans around, it doesn't really matter, right? Because the ecosystems just shift with the sea inland. Uh, but of course, like in uh, Castle Beach and Tunnel Beach, there's like a promenade, there's a street, um, so where the beach ends, the beach ends, and there's no way for it to go to go further and adjust. Um, so with sea level rise, um, much of this kind of intertidal habitat will shrink. And I think sea level rise is a bigger problem than most people realize. I think uh, it's now about four four and a half millimeters a, a year. I think sea level rise, but this year it has increased uh, by much more than that. Um, oh. And uh, there's things that we can't, you know, there's all these climate models, but there's just things that we can't really predict well. There's these tipping points, you know, if the, all the, the, the ice melt in Antarctica and, and um, Greenland, um, if all that ice melts, then, you know, there will be meters and meters of sea level rise. So that's, that's worrying. So I think entire ecosystems are, are under threat because of, uh, of climate change. On a plus point, unlike corals, which get bleached by high temperatures, we don't we haven't had mass die-offs due to high temperatures yet, have we? But I suppose it's more insidious and gradual that sort of yeah. the distribution will get pushed. Yeah, I know in in uh, Brittany there's been these um, these events of mass die-off of um, I think it's sea lettuce, right? Also okay. releasing kind of noxious gases. 
That's yeah, pretty I mean, on, on Mainport Beach, that can be uh, there can be quite a lot of rotting seaweed on that beach. Yeah, so and it's a very tough seaweed, but you know, but it lives in shallow environments and it can get extremely hot, and eventually it it, it must die. Yeah, create some nasty noxious chemicals as a result. So let's just see. Thank you, Nick. Let's see, if you've got any other questions? So the um, Charlotte asked, in your aquarium, this is going off piece a little bit, talking about anemones now, in your aquarium, are they happy to, are the anemones happy to be in close proximity? Or are there some that avoid others? Uh, i.e. is there some sort of pecking order for the best location? Um, they move around a bit. Um, and sometimes they split and, and have babies. Um, but I haven't seen this warfare where they, um, with, Matt had, had photos of that yesterday with the, uh, what are they called again? The, the Acrorygii. Acrorygii, yeah. Yes. I haven't seen that kind of uh, negative interactions yet. No. Good. So they're, they're generally well behaved. Good. <laughs> and someone said the Puffia asparagopsis is the gametophyte stage. So that was Emily. So she, um, do you mean when you say the little round fluffy stuff is what I call, that's called convergia, isn't it? Yeah. So Emily, if you can hear us, do you mean that's the gametophyte? Yes, the uh, one that looks like a puffball rather than the one that kind of looks like the yeah, so head that's of the that's called convergia one is the puffball looking one. And you think yes. that's the gametophyte. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, didn't know that. Um, I, can't, I can't blame researchers for not seeing that it's the same species, really, because, you know, it looks nothing. Was, at that point in your presentation, I was quite interested, um, Mick, because on the north coast where I live, I'm always keeping a lookout for harpoon weed. I've seen one little bit of ordinary looking harpoon weed at Fistral in Newquay, but it was on its own. And I've never seen big quantities. So your report of the Falkenbergia in St Agnes, that's quite a worry actually in a way. Um, yeah. yeah, certainly it does seem, although we haven't got any pr real concern that it's badly impacting our environment, um, we do see large amounts of that um, harpoon weed, so you know, it could potentially have right. I don't know much of it, but I, I have read that this Falkenbergia and this, um, the normal stage of the harpoon weed um, have slightly different distributions. So it could be that it's somehow stuck in this Falkenbergia stage and that the conditions are not right for the asparagopsis, for the harpoon weed stage. So it could yeah. be too exposed. And if it grows into these larger plants, they might just kind of not, not be able to withstand the wave action. Yes, I wonder. So that, yeah, that could the wave be a reason. Action, the wave action is definitely a lot harder there yeah. on the north coast. Interesting. And um, what species, this is from Josh. He says, what species of seaweed are you wanting to photo that you haven't managed to find yet? Ooh. That's a good question. I mean, there's some um, species, other species than this uh, rainbow rack that are slightly fluorescent. And I've seen it once or twice in flushing um, a related species. Um, and it would be really nice if I could see that, you know, properly underwater. Um, and I also would like to if 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 we can go diving again of course when you're diving you're mainly kind of looking for an octopus or something you know or, or a sea fan yeah. but kind of check out the deeper living seaweed species yeah um, and i think you know th those are really overlooked because you know they're a bit more boring of course than sea fans but um since i'm taking photos of these ones it would be nice to kind of see what's living deeper you get some really lovely red seaweeds, don't you? Like the yeah, yeah. Sea oak and sea beach, and yeah. lo lots of other. There's so much variety. So the the iridescent one is that dichot uh, Dictyota dichotoma. There's one of those that's quite iridescent, isn't there? Yeah, and that's I think it has been reported. I think from from Farmouth Marina. Yeah, Lisa from uh, the Record Centre found some Lisa Renox a few years ago. And, I've never yeah. seen it, but I haven't looked at the marina. Um, I sometimes. I used to go to the marina and Myler just to kind of uh, lie on my belly and kind of look what was growing. But last time I was there, I was, I was sent away by the harbour master. <laughs> you were probably a trip hazard on the, on the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it is a great way to find lots of invasive species, so these looking at in estuaries and harbours. 
And Fran, that's the next question. Fran has said, "What well, um, is anything done about in, being done about invasive seaweed species?" I think you can answer that better than than I can, Matt. Well, I have heard one project, um, the run by the Marine Biology Association, and that's Wakame Watch, and they've been collecting data on Wakame, which is a Japanese kelp that I think I mentioned in in the talk I did on seaweed. So, um, there is there is studies being done. When there's not currently uh, a species that people are being told to, to destroy um, and part of the reason for that is that it's quite hard to identify um, some of these species and there's some non-native species that look very similar to native ones and we don't want to accidentally rip up the wrong ones. Um, the, other, the other sort of feeling I think is that if you pull up seaweeds um, they are highly reproductive and it, you don't have to leave very much for them to carry on, you know, as if nothing had happened. And seaweeds naturally get ripped up by waves, don't they? And then they manage to recover. So actually how practically useful is it to get people out um, trying to control seaweeds is, is another question. And that's probably why, why it's not being done at the moment. But not to say it will never be done. Right, so move on. Uh, Shannon has said, you need to try and get the edge of your light beam on the subject to minimise backscatter. Shannon should know, she's, a, she's an expert and she's a, on the underwater photography course at the university. Shannon, um, I know I've, I've been diving with Shannon and yeah. I'd love to go diving again so she can teach me how to properly do it. Teach, teach all of us. Show me, Shannon. Oh, Jackie said, what corals are you growing at the university? I'm not quite interested in that. Okay, so this, this was... Um, started by some students who were rightly worried about the state of the Great Barrier Reef and so on. Um, and there are some efforts or there's lots of efforts around the world to try to work out how corals produce sexually. Rather, I mean, they grow quite well clonally. You can just grow them in an aquarium and they just grow. Or you break, break them off, little fragments, and you grow those. Uh, but they're also bro broadcast uh, spawners, uh, usually... Um, that's controlled by the lunar cycle. So they release eggs and sperm um, as, you know, there's certain cues when they do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's what these students want to do. And they raised money um, to buy some equipment. And, and it was just kind of try, can we, can, can a student led project propagate corals? That's basically, um, that was the whole idea. And I kind of helped, helped them setting it up um, together with a colleague. Um, who studies uh, Chris Lowe, who studies snake locks um, anemones, uh, by the way. Um, and yeah, so we had it all set up, but then of course there was lockdown. So I, I still go there to kind of maintain it, but we don't have very many. We just started with a couple because we didn't want to, uh, they're quite expensive, of course. So we didn't want to put a whole tank full of expensive corals and then having them all die yeah. a week later after the inexperienced students would take care of them. So just, just a, a couple. I, um, I used to grow corals a lot in my previous life in the aquarium world, and I've got a few contacts, so um, give me a shout if you'd like me to yeah. try and source any corals. Um, and a guy called Jamie Craggs is well worth talking to. I don't know if you've ever come across Jamie Craggs. Is he uh, at uh, Horniman? In Horniman, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really good guy. Anyway, that's, that's a different topic. <laughs> so we'll get back to seaweeds. So, um, Shannon said harpoon weed is fluorescent under a blue light, which is quite interesting. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, that's another thing. Um, um, Shannon has been taking lots of uh, really nice photos with fluorescent um, light. And I actually yeah. also have a fluorescent torch, uh, but I haven't used them on, um, on seaweeds, actually. So, yeah, that yeah. would be a really interesting kind of project to, to see which ones are fluorescent. Yeah. Yeah. And again, um, uh, presumably, as well, why they're fluorescent is, a, is an unanswered question that some researcher might want to look into. Um, someone said, do they change colour? Morag asked, do they change colour at night? I, I've never done a night dive or night snorkel in Cornwall, um, so I don't really yeah. know what it looks like, the pools. It would be really interesting to do. I think usually when it's dark and usually not the weather's not that nice, I can't be asked to get off the sofa, <laughs> get in a get in a moist wetsuit, and then walk hundred meters across jagged rocks. 
yeah. and swim in 10 degrees cold water. So that's why it hasn't happened. <laughs> in but my experience, they, really they don't really look any different at night once you shine a torch on them. Obviously, it's darker at night. Right. But if you shine a torch on them, they look exactly the same in my, my experience. And I think the colour change that you've been noticing seasonally is probably more due to maturation of the seaweeds the fact they start reproducing at certain times of year and also they get bleached don't they by sunlight yeah like um, you see in this photo you see the coral wheat at the, at the bottom that's pink but this this has turned kind of white yeah and that's probably as a result of the you know prolonged yeah exposure to sunlight yeah especially at low tide um i think what i've seen in summer on the north coast there's it looks a lot fresher so there's less of that kind of bleaching and um and kind of decay of, of seaweeds on so, the north coast yeah i think that's because it's being refreshed by the yeah. constant cycle of you know a few weeks with heavy swells and then a few weeks with less swells so you just get a, um you get yeah. more of a turnover and you don't get a build up of sort of old looking seaweeds because they're yeah. being removed Right, well, I think we're, we're near the end of the, the, uh, the questions, unless anyone else has got any more. We've got, we've got a very nice comment from Anka and Greg saying, can we start a video log, a, a log, please? Because they're really enjoying our talk. So, yeah, um, and, uh, you know, I totally agree. The experts we've brought in, yourself, Mick, and Heather, and all the other amazing people that have been talking on our, on our YouTube channel, you know, they've, they've been really, really appreciated today. So thanks very much, um, and uh, I hope the audience have all enjoyed it. I certainly have, and uh, yeah, it's been really great hearing all about your passion for these uh, these beautiful subjects. I mean, I, I I am totally inspired and blown away whenever I see these photos. And I, you know, I've done a, I've looked at a lot of coral reefs and I've kept a lot of incredible creatures in aquariums, etc. Over the years, but actually, I think the colours and the you know the diversity that you're capturing in these images really really are you know second to me absolutely so yeah so thank you very much mick okay you're and, welcome. Uh, and anyone who wants to find out more please visit mick's blog uh, and bola nestle and follow him on social media on instagram and face do you facebook or just instagram mick just instagram that's that's just enough for me <laughs> just instagram yeah um you can't do it all can you no. but yeah um, and uh you know come along anyone who wants to come and see some of these seaweeds join us on one of our shore search surveys that once we're allowed back out we'll be uh, running lots of them all around the cornish coast and uh yeah please uh please look out for more talks like this and uh watch them on our youtube channel there you go thank you very much all right bye-bye cheers mate thank you